Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining the Startup Society's Foundation podcast. Today, we're joined by a very special guest. His name is Jack Hedge. He's the executive director at the Utah Inland Port Authority, arguably one of the largest infrastructure projects in the, the state's history. Jack, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate uh, being here. Thanks for reaching out to us. Absolutely. So I think uh, before we get started, I think we should define some of the, the key aspects of the project. So first of all, uh, what is an inland port? Well, uh, a port is sort of definitionally, it's just a place where different transportation modes come together. So a seaport is where, you know, sea traffic comes together with landside traffic. An airport is where air traffic comes together with landside traffic. So an inland port is just where different modes of, of transportation come together. And in our case here in Utah, it's where road, rail, and air all come together. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's a real hub for intermodal facilities. And one huge aspect of it is the foreign trade zone aspect. So what exactly is a foreign trade zone and how does it impact the project? Yeah, so a foreign trade zone really allows, it's a big benefit for importers. And it, what it does is it allows importers who are bringing in maybe component pieces that need to be repacked or repackaged or assembled into a final product. The ability to bring in those, those component pieces and rather than pay tariff on those individual components, pay tariff on sort of that repacked or, or final product. And in doing so, it allows them to reduce tariffs and reduce the cost of that final good. Here on the Startup Society's Foundation podcast, we often talk about special zones as a way to increasing uh, good urbanism and economic development, um, and especially how it impacts trade. In what sense does the foreign trade zone, if at all, help the ongoing uh, trade war? Well, I think it, it, it does give uh, a, a user the ability to, to look at those different tariff components and see if there's a way to, to, uh, to, to maximize the efficiency uh, of the tariff regime by using the foreign trade zone. Um, so if maybe they have component pieces that are coming in, but they build something uh, from those things, it may be more advantageous to them to defray the, the tariff until they get it actually fully assembled and then pay tariff on the, com on the completed project because then it's only a, a portion of the overall price of the project. So just doing things like that are, are a good way for um, uh, companies to use a special zone like a foreign trade zone to, um, um, you know, to help try to minimize the impact of tariffs um, and, and just sort of maximize their overall cost efficiency of their supply chain. So since there is this intermodal facility that is going to be built and there's these, these benefits and tariff reductions, what is sort of the perceived benefit for uh, Salt Lake City and Utah as a whole economically? Well, economically, first of all, it's, it's, it's a significant job creator, job generator. Uh, I came from the Port of Los Angeles. And uh, the Port of Los Angeles is a relatively small footprint physically. It's about 7,000 acres total with, with its sister port of Long Beach uh, is about 10,000 acres total uh, in size out of you know, all of Southern California. But one in nine jobs in California is tied to the activities of the, of the port of LA and, and, and Long Beach. So there are huge impacts uh, in terms of job and economic activity. Uh, and so that's, I think, the, one of the primary benefits of this is the, the long-term sustainable nature of, of job creation in and around the, the Salt Lake area, uh, in and around the state of, of Utah as a whole. We are a statewide entity. So the, the hope of economically developing by creating this intermodal facility and, and the, the special zone status, it's not a, a new topic in Utah policy. In fact, it's been discussed for a very long time. What is sort of the history of the inland port in its many iterations? Yeah, it really has been talked about for a while. In fact, I've seen some uh, plans and discussions for it going back you know, 30 and 40 years. Um, it, it really sort of gained some, some momentum and some speed about 10 years ago. Uh, the city of Salt Lake really uh, promoted, promoted maybe in the right term, but really you know, pushed forward the development of this area uh, as a potential inland port. It already had a lot of the pieces um, that you would see in a hub. There, 
intermodal rail facility that, that is run by the UP, the confluence of major interstate arterial freeways, uh, the expansion potential for the, for the airport, uh, the other rail lines coming into and out of the area. Um, you know, it, it's already sort of the crossroads of the West. And, and Salt Lake City and others uh, saw the potential for uh, to sort of expand that and, and really kind of become the crossroads of uh, North America. It's very clear what the benefits are, but one of the common themes of, of the Utah Inland Port is pushback from important stakeholders, such as the government and, and local citizens of the area. What has sort of been the historical pushback from these stakeholders that prevented it from historically being implemented? I think the fears in the past are, are the same as, as the fears now. What are gonna be the impacts of, of a development like this on traffic, on air quality, uh, and on the, on the wetlands habitat areas in and around the Great Salt Lake. And I think those are, are legitimate questions and concerns. I think they've been out there for a long time. And those, those questions and concerns continue to be out there. So I think that's always been a bit of a, I want to say a stumbling block because clearly development has happened out there. A lot of development has happened out there. And there has been progress uh, made out there well before the Port Authority was, was formed last year. There's been a couple iterations of, of the structure of the Port Authority itself uh, each time that these concerns have been voiced. Um, and some people are unclear what the structure of the Port Authority is. Can you uh, detail for our li listeners what exactly the structure of the Port Authority is in its current iteration? Yeah, so we are uh, chartered by the, by the state. We are a public corporation uh, established by the state and we have a statewide mandate to look not just at the jurisdictional area out here, uh, outside on the west side of, of Salt Lake City, but elsewhere around the state, where um, transportation infrastructure, logistics, uh, freight movement infrastructure uh, is necessary and beneficial to sort of the overall economic development of, of that area. Uh, here in, in the Salt Lake area, we're focused on what is, is called the, the Northwest Quadrant and, and trying to um, optimize the development out there in such a way that it, it you know, really does build on the existing infrastructure and the existing um, uh, routes and, and, and demand uh, for that area and do so in a way that does uh, alleviate or, or, or at least mitigate those uh, environmental impacts and concerns that people have around air quality, uh, traffic congestion, wetlands habitat, things like that. In other areas of the state, it's looking at, at you know, maybe what is, is, is needed to support uh, expansion of manufacturing or, uh, or other opportunities in different parts around the state and, and helping them develop the most efficient and sustainable infrastructure to help promote that growth in those areas uh, into the future as well. So it's, it means sometimes different things to different people, kind of depending on where they sit. So why did uh, the, the, the center of this project, why is it revolving around uh, the Northwest Quadrant? What is it so attractive about this particular site? Well, uh, again, it goes back to the existing infrastructure that's there, the existing intermodal rail facility uh, of the UP and the mainline uh, connection directly to the ports of LA and Long Beach and the port of Oakland, um, the ability to, to uh, expand on that um, as, as that grows and develops, um, the ability to, to manage that in a more functional way, um, working with, with the railroads and, and cargo owners to, to, to really maximize and optimize that asset, uh, the existing uh, freeway infrastructure uh, into and out of the system, and, and looking at ways to, to uh, optimize that infrastructure for, for goods movement. Um, we're the most truck dependent uh, state in the nation. And so how do, we, how do we build on that infrastructure and that system in a way that optimizes it and makes it more attractive? And then the, the ability to work with the airport and the air carriers uh, to look at ways to, to utilize that infrastructure and, and maybe uh, other ways to increase utilization of air freight and air cargo uh, to, to meet the demands of, of the area of the region. Uh, it's just a really unique set of facilities that already exist. And so it's, you're, you're not having to reinvent the wheel out here. Uh, you're able to build on 
uh, infrastructure that already exists and, and, and already serves us all. It's absolutely true. There's a tremendous amount of development there, not just with the airport and the intermodal facility, there's a development of the prison and property owners already looking to develop. So it serves as a really great hub. But as you said, this isn't merely going to be in a Northwest quadrant. There's going to be satellite locations located throughout Utah and what some, including the port, have called the hub and spoke model. Can you explain what exactly they mean by that? Yeah, and I, and I do think hub and spoke is a little bit uh, of a misnomer because I think that implies that things originated up in these outer areas and then are concentrated here in the Salt Lake. And that's not at all what we're looking at doing. I think satellite is a much more appropriate term. And it, because um, while the, the port authority, uh, it, it's, its primary location is this Northwest Quadrant, these other locations out, out, in, the, out in the other areas around the state um, are, are critically important in those locations. And they have supply chain advantages in those locations that we want to try to, to work with the companies to, to exploit and develop. So we don't want to um, bring everything back into Salt Lake City and then redistribute from here. We want to utilize the infrastructure here in, in the Salt Lake City area to, to, to its maximum potential and, and optimize it to the best way possible. But we don't want to create more issues and more problems by forcing cargo into this area that doesn't need to come into this area. If there's not a compelling reason for it to be here, there are other ways to get cargo to and from these other areas of the state that are much more efficient and much more cost effective and have much less impact on our environment. Right, right. That's kind of one of the, con the political concerns of this whole project, uh, the hub and spoke, the idea that uh, Salt Lake City, which does not have a zoning authority over the, the Northwest Quadrant any longer, um, they would be all the infrastructure. Actually, that's a, that's a, mis that's a, that's a misnomer. Good, I'm glad you're correcting me. This is necessary. Just understanding, <laughs> yeah. So, so Salt Lake City absolutely has uh, zoning and, 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 uh, and land use management control and permitting control over the Northwest Quadrant. What was given to the Port Authority is a, um, um, uh, an appeal um, authority. If someone feels like, if, if a developer feels like uh, Salt Lake City or one of the other jurisdictions, you know, our, our boundary actually crosses four different jurisdictional boundaries, by far the, the majority of it in Salt Lake City, but it also touches West, uh, West Valley, um, uh, Magna, and, and parts of unincorporated Salt Lake County. If, if a developer in one of those areas feels like the, the authority, the, the jurisdictional authority didn't follow their jurisdictional plans um, as laid out, the, the land use plan, the zoning maps, whatever, they have the right theoretically to, to bring that to the, to the board and ask the board to rule. Uh, in, that, you know, in that regard, the board you know, may, may find that the developer does in fact have, you know, have, a, have a legitimate um, concern. And, and, and probably where, where it would go is, um, you know, to ask the, the uh, jurisdiction that does have authority to look at it again. Um, but we don't have the right to change zoning or change uh, the authority, uh, nor would we ever uh, want that right. Um, we don't, that's not, that is not what we are set to do. We're not staffed to do that. We don't have the, the, um, the expertise to do that. Uh, it would just simply be uh, going back to the, the, the entity that does have that jurisdiction and asking them to look at it again and take another look at did they really follow their, their plan and their process. It's great that you're thinking about uh, community engagement, both on the governmental and the, and the local level. And in fact, when the community engagement report was released about the project, you made it clear that one of your big priorities with the project is transparency with the project. And, to ensure that the Port Authority is constantly engaged in the community. Uh, if you were to just, well, I mean, you're on a podcast, so it's presumably to the public. If you're to talk directly to the public about transparency and what steps you're gonna to take to continually engage with the community, what steps will there be? What would you want to say? I mean, it, it's going to, it, there's a continuing process there. I mean, Matt, as, as late as today, uh, you know, doing our, our planning of kind of our next phase here of our planning process which uh, is, is another round of community engagement, another round of community outreach uh, to look at the different scenarios 
that, that have come from this, this first round of, of engagement go back out to the community and, and revet those, those, uh, those scenarios and those ideas and you know, the things that we've heard to this point. And, and you know, here, are the, here are the things that we're looking at doing and getting their input and feedback on, on, on what they think about this thing. It's also doing things like this, you know, reaching out through different media, uh, through the more traditional media, newspaper, radio, television, but also things like podcasts, um, um, more social media. Uh, we're going to uh, have a social media um, presence that we haven't had prior to. Uh, developing a new website that we'll use to, to uh, for outreach and things like that as well. So we're going to we're, we're putting together a fairly comprehensive um, uh, communication strategy. Uh, that will engage the public more, give the public more opportunities to uh, engage with us and give us their thoughts and their feedback, and uh, and it be a constant, ongoing thing. There's not an end point to public to, to our public engagement strategy. Uh, it's an ongoing and ever evolving thing, and, and and you'll see a lot more of us in the future. What do you think is an option forward for the port on things such as air quality, which seems to be on the highest on the list for most people in the Salt Lake area? Right. So I, you know, I come from a I come from a background of, of, of trying to to mitigate and 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 fix uh, problems that exist in the past. I think one of the things that we have a big opportunity to do here with with projects that the port authority um, uh, gets engaged with, gets involved with, will be to see that help incentivize and see that those things get developed um, in, in, in the right way in the first place. Um, one of the things that I've said to people around here is, you know, we're not really going to, to uh, determine the what gets built, the market will determine what gets built, but we can have a say in how it gets built and how it gets operated in the future. And, and as particularly as it relates to air quality, you know, one of the things that we want to do, use the tax increment that we've been given, is use that to incentivize the development of buildings that are, are higher efficiency, uh, have a higher um, um, or lower um, uh, fuel um, intake, or a lower electricity use, um, a lower lighting use, HVAC systems, things like that, so that so that we, we reduce the amount of of, of greenhouse gases and, and other things associated with the buildings themselves. Uh, and then we also want to try to incentivize the use of zero and near zero emissions truck technologies um, uh, for, for the trucks that, that, that are calling at, on the facilities, uh, delivering to and from the facilities, um, as well as the equipment being used inside the facilities or around the facilities. So also incentivizing the use of zero and near zero emissions, um, you know, lift trucks and forklifts and cranes and, and that kind of thing uh, around their, oper their operations. Uh, we want to work with, the, with the, our partners in the rail industry to, uh, to, to modernize and update their, their fleets uh, to be the most efficient um, uh, and, and least emitting uh, fleets that they have, whether they be the long haul class one railroads or the short haul switching railroads in and around that operating around the area. Um, we want to try to uh, develop programs and, and, and policies uh, and, and that will uh, de-conflict traffic to the extent possible, uh, incentivize, maybe, maybe that means incentivizing off-peak drive times for trucks. Maybe it, it, it uh, is working with UDOT to create um, uh, designated truck routes into and out of the facility that, that de-conflict uh, things. So there's a myriad of things that we can look that we're looking around the world at right now and trying to see who's doing what, what are some of the best practices that are out there, what are the things that we can uh, work to help incentivize and implement here in Utah uh, so that we can have the most efficient and most effective uh, logistics hub anywhere in the world. What are some of the most interesting best practices that you've drawn from other inland port or intermodal facilities? Yeah, I, you know, some of them uh, in, in, in uh, outside of Rotterdam in, in Europe, uh, there's a, a big push to, uh, to, for everything to be electrified, highly electrified, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and things like that. But one of the ways that they've done that is by deploying uh, solar on the rooftops and, and, and uh, um, sort of becoming a net zero uh, 
um, uh, emitter uh, in and around that inland port complex that supports the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, and outside of uh, uh, Charleston, West Virginia, uh, I'm in mean, South Carolina, um, there's the, the Greenville, uh, South Carolina inland port uh, is almost exclusively served by rail to and from the, the, the port of Charleston, uh, which, you know, if you think about it, every 100 rail cars takes almost 300 trucks off the road. Uh, so to the extent that we can maximize and utilize our rail, uh, for existing rail infrastructure, which is frankly, it's second to none, optimize that, use it more efficiently and effectively. Uh, so looking at things like that, things that we did at the Port of LA and Long Beach, uh, our joint uh, Clean Air Action Plan, uh, that we established at, at the two port at the two ports uh, to mitigate and eliminate um, uh, diesel particulate matter, greenhouse gas emissions from port operations. But we've seen 90 plus percent reductions in those types of, of, uh, of pollution e emitter emitters from port operations. Um, um, the, the issue there was we had to go back and do it sort of after the fact. Uh, we've got the chance to implement programs and policies like that here up front, uh, and so that we don't we don't face some of those same issues going forward. So there's lots of good examples out there. Excellent. So those definitely address the values of, of environmentalism and protecting the environment. Uh, I haven't looked at the studies, but are those projects, these, these different type of infrastructure initiatives, especially with renewable energy and having almost a, a zero carbon emissions, are they financially sustainable at this juncture? They have been, yeah, they have been. Um, you know, a lot of times, what have, there's a, a lot of times there's a, a bigger uh, uh, capital expenditure, capex cost up front, but the operating cost uh, savings are significant. Uh, and, and in a lot of cases, you see a break even on that additional capex within the first year, or two or three years uh, of operation. And these are these tend to be large sort of infrastructure type projects. So they've got 20, 30 year lives uh, to them. And, uh, and we've seen the ability to, to recapture uh, and, then, and then benefit from that lower operating cost going forward. Uh, you know, it, it costs a lot of money to relamp an entire industrial facility to LED lighting, for example. Um, but once you've done that, uh, your operating costs, your lighting costs are a third of what they used to be uh, prior to. Things like that go a long way. And uh, once you start looking at those dollars and cents, uh, it doesn't take long to make the decision. Going green pays, but environmental concerns, they aren't limited just to air or carbon emissions, especially, no, especially in the state of Utah, where they pride themselves, and, and I can personally attest to this, one of the most beautiful, diverse set of ecological biomes I've ever seen, and a huge density by the Salt Lake. What will the project do to protect that environment that has a host of, of different bird species and, and, and what have you in the Northwest Quadrant? Well, you know that is it, it, that is critical habitat. It, it, it's critical to our our whole uh, ecological system uh, in, in North America. It is the it's the terminus of one of the of one of the major flyways for migratory birds um, uh, in North America, and it is absolutely critical that we protect that that habitat. Uh, there's a natural area um, uh, that has that was designated by Salt Lake City in its uh, in its master planning. Uh, the legislation that incorporated us recognizes that, and we intend to move forward to, to try to preserve and protect that, do everything that, uh, that we have in our powers to preserve and protect that natural area. And we're starting to have those conversations and discussions now with uh, the managers of the habitat area, the Audubon uh, Society out there, with uh, uh, other interested stakeholders, landowners in the area, about how we can work with them to preserve that natural area uh, and, 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 and buffer uh, any of our industrial development uh, from that habitat. Going into the future, as we, as we develop, as, as properties develop out there in the future and the Inland Port Authority is part of that development, we want to incentivize and encourage the kind of development too that is bird friendly, uh, that doesn't um, distract birds, that doesn't um, um, attract birds. Um, so things like uh, looking at, at the lighting systems out there and are there ways to uh, eliminate or mitigate the, the light pollution that causes birds to get disoriented at night? Uh, are there things that we can do 
in terms of the, the, the development of, of sites uh, using low impact development techniques so that stormwater runoff and things like that get shunted back into uh, the natural ecosystem, the groundwater system and things after treatment, get shunted back into the groundwater system, things like that so that the aquifers recharge, we eliminate the diversion of water from those types of, of developed areas. Those kinds of things are important. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at because that, again, that, that habitat area out there is absolutely critical. And, and we're gonna do everything we can to protect it. Well, that's amazing. And it's incredible to have, it's very important to have uh, stakeholders protect what they already have. But another element of it in order to have crucial stakeholder engagement is also to grow what they currently don't have. And there's been a lot said about the project that in economic terms, abstract economic terms, it will benefit uh, Salt Lake City and Utah as a whole, but it, not so much in concrete terms. What can be said to citizens that they can concretely know that this will improve their lives? Well, you know, every, uh, that's always a subjective question, I think. Right. Um, I, I, think I think one of the things that's important to, to, to recognize is that Logistics is not a, if you build it, they will come type of thing. Logistics facilities and, and freight movement and, and freight handling facilities are a function of population growth. They're, they're, it's, it's just a simple math. The more people you have, the more stuff you need. And so there will be growth of freight and logistics in this area, um, regardless of whether there's an inland port authority or not simply because that is the area that has been designated for, you know, for future growth. So I think it's important to recognize, so it, so it comes down to, to me to a couple of things. How do we manage that growth so that it is the most efficient and the less impactful, uh, negatively impactful in our lives? And how do we try to promote um, the, the type of businesses and jobs out there that are uh, sustainable jobs? And, and by that, I mean, they are good family wage jobs. They are the type of, of, of middle class, so, so that the workers that are out there have the type of middle class living that they can, uh, that they can feel comfortable with and they can raise their children and their families on. And, and I think that's an important thing to do. And so we, we want to engage um, in, in, in job training programs and, and development out there to provide the level of skill and training so that people can take these these jobs as they come in and and frankly logistics is 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 changing uh, it's not as labor intensive as it used to be it is more automated now than it used to be so there aren't as many jobs per square foot in a, in a warehouse as there used to be but the jobs that are there are higher paying higher skilled jobs because you have to be much more uh, technically trained in order to do those jobs. And so what are the programs that we can establish working with our stakeholders in, in the schools, in, the, in, in labor, in, uh, and with the, the developers and, and others around to develop the kind of training programs, apprenticeship programs, things like that, that can lead to those higher skill, higher paying jobs. They're gonna be necessary in that environment. I think the other thing too is really what kind of business do we want to attract to that area? The, the warehouse distribution that's just pure to distribution, to some degree will kind of take care of itself, then it will respond to the market. But in terms of attracting businesses in there, more uh, technologically advanced manufacturing is I think a really strong um, uh, position for us to be in. Because of the, the logistics facilities that are there, locating a manufacturing uh, company there, um, gives that manufacturing company access to a really um, efficient network that's going to help them manage their supply chain costs better. And so that's going to lead to a higher uh, quotient, job quotient, than you might otherwise see uh, just from a, a typical sort of warehouse distribution. Thing. And then it's, it's working again with, with the schools and things like that too to develop the programs that a workforce in that area is going to need. So, you know, after school programs so that, so that workers on shift, uh, frankly, don't have to worry about their, where their kids are, what their kids are doing at, after three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, 
um, trying to really look at what are the needs of those communities and those areas out there uh, and, and what are the kinds of programs that we can help develop uh, that are going to attract the kind of jobs out there that we all want to see. I'm glad you hit on the point of the types of jobs and, and, and going beyond simply warehousing um, because I think that's absolutely critical. What are some strategies um, that can attract sort of higher tech jobs? I know there's the Silicon Valley slopes. Those stakeholders mm -hmm. can be engaged. Mm -hmm. There's also the universities. Maybe there could mm -hmm. even be a new zone framework that doesn't just reward uh, companies with reduced tariffs uh, and with tax increments. What are, what are some other strategies to attack a, a high tech companies for high tech jobs? Well, one of, the, one of the pieces of infrastructure that, that's out there to a large degree, and I don't think people uh, recognize it, and I don't think it gets enough attention, is the amount of fiber, uh, fiber optic um, it, it line that's out there that's existing in that area today. A uh, huge amount of investment has been made in that regard, and that forms the backbone for what could be a very robust um, network out there to attract the kind of high-tech uses uh, that are really driving the logistics industry today. Um, it's not so much about autonomous vehicles, but when you're talking about more automated facilities, when you're talking about uh, trying to geofence your facilities so you can control better who comes and goes from your facilities, um, you're, and you're trying to give more transparency to the supply chain, um, you need a robust uh, uh, communications network to do that. And it's a combination of, of fiber in the ground, providing the backbone for, for data transmission, and that can support and stand up um, kind of the latest um, um, rollout of wireless technologies uh, that are, that's coming very, very rapidly. And quite frankly, being able to build that type of, of, of area out and be able to promote it to the market as a smart port, not just a, not just a, a you know, good road and rail and, and air infrastructure, uh, but good utilities and a smart, um, a smart location uh, is a very, very strong competitive advantage that we, that we have and we need to exploit. No, I, I absolutely agree. And you actually are in a prime location for that. Uh, uh, the you, um, Salt Lake City is a location of Medici Ventures, a blockchain firm. And blockchain and other distributed ledger, uh, ledger technologies like Ethereum and Bitcoin, many have pointed to that these technologies can be great for inventory management and supply chain yeah. management. Do you foresee the Utah Inland Port using any of these technologies or maybe partnering with these blockchain companies in order to automate and make these processes more transparent? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, you know, we've had some, some preliminary conversations with, with, with people in, in just that regard. Um, I think our role in it is to really help them help develop out the the infrastructure so that the the so that we're sort of technology agnostic. Uh, different companies have used different technologies. Uh, what they need is a robust uh, infrastructure backbone to be able to deploy their system. So the system that UP uses, for instance, to maybe control uh, their trains and um, uh, and, and understand what cargo are in the boxes that are in their, in, on their trains um, may be different than the technology that Amazon uses um, to know where its inventory is uh, in transit at any one time. But the two technologies need to talk to each other. And, and to do that, they need a good, robust uh, uh, infrastructure in place. And I think that's more the role of the port is to build that infrastructure and then promote the use of those technologies within the port's boundaries. Um, I think that's a, a more appropriate role for the port to play than trying to pick one technology over the other, trying to pick winners and losers. That's great. There's a whole most multiplicity of different exponential technologies, technologies yeah. that will prove in the future that need to be looked at. When you're looking at the different and exponential technology sectors that are growing in Utah, biomedical, uh, uh, aerospace, et cetera, which ones excite you the most? And is there different strategies you would use to attract them to the Utah Island port? I mean, they're all, they're all very exciting in, in their own right. And, and, and there are different, I think, different ways to attract them. You're seeing a lot of biomedical um, uh, device development 
in and around the Salt Lake City, the Wasatch Front itself. Uh, I think there are there could be tremendous opportunities to work with those companies to to look at this area as um, as kind of the the, the node, the, the center point of their supply chains, and how to uh, utilize the, the, this you know, what we have here and this function here to really maximize the efficiency of their supply chains. Uh, I think that's a, a huge opportunity for that particular group. I think with aerospace, a lot of that is, is, is located a bit more to the north. Uh, so how do we work with them and the infrastructure that's more uh, located up to the north to help them uh, maximize their needs? What are their, what are their needs and what do they see as their opportunities? to optimize their supply chains and how do we work with them in those um, jurisdictions um, closer to those locations um, to, to help them do that. And so again, I think it's kind of looking at, I think the, the outdoor gear, outdoor sports and equipment uh, manufacturing segment is a huge opportunity. Uh, it's very robust. It's very strong here in Utah. It's growing and expanding all the time. And I think there are really strong opportunities there uh, to look at their uh, consumer goods, uh, supply chains, um, what are the most efficient ways to use what we have here to help uh, grow uh, and expand that um, that industry sector as well. I think there's huge opportunities in, in all these different things. And, and frankly, some of them are going to need different things than, than others. And they're going to be headquartered or locus in, in different locations. And it's going to be important to sort of get out there and really start talking to them and understanding what it is that, that they need. But those are three clusters that, that really come to mind, uh, sort of locally right off the bat, but I think we could have some impact on very quickly. Yes, they're, they're very exciting, but to many, it might cut off, come off as idle talk unless there is pending investment to pay for the infrastructure. However, uh, Utah Inland Port benefits not just from one uh, special zone framework, it also benefits from a second opportunity zone frameworks, which allow investors to invest in the area then defer in their capital gains. How is the yeah. Utah Inland Port uh, working with opportunity zone investors in order to secure financing in this way? Yeah, and we've, we've only just started to, to scratch the surface of how the, the Inland Port Authority's jurisdictional areas and the opportunity zone areas can overlap and, and enhance each other. Um, you know, the, the Northwest Quadrant there's certainly overlap there. We're working with um, uh, some groups that, that are focused on opportunity zone investments around the state. And I believe there's, I wanna say there's 23 opportunity zones so far that have sort of been uh, identified or, 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 or designated. And we're looking at, with, with that group, uh, at those different opportunity zones and sort of seeing who's in, who's in those opportunity zones and how can we, approach them, how can we sort of tailor uh, a, a tax increment uh, finance based backed financing program uh, along with uh, what's available through the Opportunity Zone uh, structure to really sort of uh, maximize the impact of that for investment, for raising capital, and for attracting investment. Um, the amount of capital that is available uh, for the programs like this is huge. There's tremendous amount of capital available for these things. And I will say, um, to a large degree, that capital will stay on the sidelines if the kinds of facilities that are being built aren't sustainable, don't meet their sustainability goals. That capital will stay on the sidelines. So it, I think to attract it and to maximize it, we're gonna need to, to work in all of these jurisdictional areas uh, to, to build the, the most sustainable, um, smartest facilities that, that, that can be built. I'm glad that all these different values are aligning up to this point. And part of the reason that can, this can be done is by stacking different special zone uh, frameworks on top of each other. Do you think that it's just, possible- just to maximize them, yes. Exactly. Do you think it's possible, though, that there could be another zone framework stacked upon the Utah Inland Port, one that uh, motivates these more high-tech companies to come uh, to the port? Do you think there's an appetite for it in the Utah legislature? And if, if there was an ideal world, this new framework, what type of policies do you think it should allow for? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's really forward-looking. Forward 
uh, and and we start, we've just started sort of having those discussions as well. I think there is appetite for it in the legislature. I think the legislature, I think that's the kind of industry and business the legislature wants to attract, but also wants to, to see develop, uh, you know, here in a more homegrown fashion. And so, you know, what are the kinds of policies and things that we could use to, to uh, promote that? You know, one of the things we've talked about is, is having, is, is getting the Port Authority um, a, an additional special services zone designation, which would allow us to, um, to fund and, and help promote uh, or, or, or drive the development of certain types of infrastructure uh, to support those kinds of, of industries. Um, where we could provide, um, uh, we could aggregate, um, um, you know, low emissions, low carbon um, uh, energy development. We could um, uh, promote the development of uh, private LTE networks, uh, things like that, that, that those companies need to have uh, to be able to, to promote their, their development. Uh, and, and that would be another special zone uh, or special class that, that the, the Utah Land Port be designated and kind of focus those, the powers that the, the Port Authority would be granted on the types of, of, of development that would help attract that, that kind of company. Another thing that we've kind of talked about, uh, and this is something that I personally want to focus on, is helping to, is, is making us a, uh, um, um, a center of excellence in developing uh, low emissions, zero emissions, cargo handling equipment, and, and the application of technologies in, in those areas. And so uh, you know, we've kicked around some ideas about how we might best go forward in promoting that and pulling together the requisite, um, not just tax incentives and things like that, but, but policy, statewide policy that, uh, that, that recognizes the, the depth of that market, uh, recognizes the kind of, of of uh, uh, investment that'll be required to really do that and, and pulls together the different disparate pieces uh, sort of under one umbrella to help promote um, uh, the, the state as a, as a center of excellence in that particular um, arena. Um, so, it, you know, things like that, we're, we're just starting to scratch the surface on. I love that, especially economic green zone, uh, lifting barriers to entry for green companies, possibly tax burdens. Uh, yeah, just make it a green hub. That sounds fantastic. Well, excellent. Um, so it looks like we're nearing our time here, but we talked about a lot of great things. But just to, to cap everything off, can you give us a vision for what you'd like to, to accomplish in year five, year 10, and then year 30? Well, you know, I, I don't have it really broken down in uh, on, a, on a schedule like that, but I can say that, you know, I, I think what we, what my vision is, is to create an, an inland port uh, complex, an inland port system that is statewide. It's not so, it's not so centric in one particular location, but it's a statewide system, a statewide network of integrated, uh, interconnected, smart, sustainable, logistics facilities that really sort of power freight movement, good movement uh, in, in, in Utah and the, in, and the Intermountain West, um, you know, well into the future and, and, and beyond 30 years. Uh, this is a generational opportunity that we have. And we have the opportunity to really attract the brightest minds in the, in the, in the industry to look at what we're doing here look at what is coming in the next 10 to 20 years. How do we prepare for that? And how do we make that so that it's sustainable here for the next 50 to 100 years? And I think it's a unique opportunity. It's the only opportunity like this I'm aware of, certainly anywhere in the United States and maybe anywhere else in the world. And I am just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I think it's a huge, uh, tremendous opportunity for all of us. And, uh, um, it's very aspirational, but I think it's very achievable. Jack, I'm glad that you, your team, the city of Salt Lake and the state of Utah get to embark on this adventure. And I hope to see a glorious future come out of it. Jack, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Joe, thank you very much. I appreciate the interest and uh, talk to you again sometime. Absolutely.